Greetings from Woods Chapel United Methodist Church. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message. We invite you to worship with us. Our Sunday worship times are 8 a.m., 9.05 a.m., 10.10 a.m., 11.15 a.m., and 5 o'clock p.m. We are located off Highway 291 between Woods Chapel Road and Lakewood Boulevard in Lee Summit, Missouri. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at 816-795-8848, extension 321. We hope you find this message meaningful and relevant in your daily life. Is it a sin to be glad that Easter's over? <laughs> Today and for the next uh, two Sundays, so three weeks altogether, we're going to be in a uh, post-Easter sermon series on the story from John chapter 21. Uh, it's one of my favorite uh, uh, resurrection stories, uh, Jesus' appearance after his resurrection. Uh, in this story, uh, Jesus is, uh, uh, appears on the seashore and the disciples don't recognize him. And uh, they're, they're fishing and they don't understand who he is until they uh, catch a giant net-breaking load of fish. And... Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, uh, why they didn't recognize Jesus and maybe why we don't and how we might. Uh, next week we're going to talk about uh, the, the boatload of fish. So bring your poles and your hats and your stuff. Don't bring any hooks because we don't want anybody to get hurt, but bring your fish and stuff and we'll have a lot of fun. Uh, I'm serious, so wear it. Okay. Uh, and then the following, the, the, the third week, we're going to talk about... Uh, this very interesting personal encounter that Jesus has with Peter. Um, and I want to tell you about this because I want you to be thinking about this in advance. Jesus singles Peter out and sits down with him and, and says to him, do you love me more than these other things in your life? Do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than this? Well, if you do, then I have something I'd like for you to consider. And, and what I want you to, be, to think about for the next couple of weeks is, uh, what would that be like for Jesus to have a personal encounter with you, where face to face, nobody else, just the two of you, and he's asking, what are the other things in your life, Jeff? Do you love me more than that? Do you love me more than that? If you do, then let's talk about your future. So that's... Uh, something to think about. But today, uh, he is easy to miss. Let's stand for our scripture lesson, John 21, verses 1 to 6. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was him. He called out to them, friends, haven't you caught any fish? No, they answered. He said, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. This is uh, post-Easter. It's the time when I notoriously spend a few weeks picking on the disciples because they're like hapless. Uh, because they have all these chances and they don't get it and Jesus appears to them and they're still hiding and going back to fishing. And as I was thinking about uh, 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 preparing this message today, I kind of had a feeling that I needed to go easy on the disciples. Uh, I shouldn't pick on them this year, so I'm not going to do it. Because uh, it occurred to me if I was a disciple at that time, um, maybe uh, I would have had just as much trouble that I would have struggled in just as many ways and maybe they're not as, as big of boneheads as I thought. Maybe all humans uh, struggle with figuring this stuff out. And it occurred to me that, you know, 
uh, what might a, a two-minute movie of your life or my life look like in heaven if the angels go down and look at this uh, film and they say, okay, I got two minutes of Walt Barnes and I got two minutes of Sharon Farrell and I got two minutes of, of Jeff Brinkman. I think the angels would be going, hey, come over here. This guy doesn't get it. Come here and look at this bonehead. So um, since we probably fail as many times and ways as they do, I'm going to go easy on the disciples today. Let's just talk about the fact that uh, Jesus is evidently easy to miss after the resurrection. There are a number of stories where people encounter Jesus and they're not sure who they're dealing with. In no particular order, in Acts chapter 9, uh, Saul, who's been out murdering Christians, is on the way to Damascus to collect some more. And a voice uh, comes out of heaven, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, all of us know that's Jesus. And I sort of feel like Saul ought to have known that uh, he wasn't persecuting anyone else's followers. But uh, he's blinded and he says, uh, who are you, Lord? So he knows this is uh, someone to be reckoned with at least. And the voice says, I'm Jesus, who you are persecuting. Well, I might let him off the hook because we don't know that he ever met Jesus. Uh, and and uh, uh, we don't know that, that Saul had lots of experiences with Jesus as the disciples did. But uh, clearly, here's, here's a place where uh, after the first encounter, Jesus has to do something else to help uh, someone understand who he is. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the story on the road to Emmaus in the book of Luke, where two disciples are, are down the road, and it's after the resurrection, and they're talking about the suffering and death, and and everything that's happened, and Jesus appears, uh, begins to walk alongside them, but they don't recognize him for some reason. And they walk a long way, and he tells them uh, about all the things uh, uh, that, that happened in the scriptures pertaining to him, and they, they don't recognize him. Finally, they get to the place where they're going, and he sits down with, with them for a meal. And when he breaks the bread, their eyes are open, and they see that it's, it's Jesus. Uh, we have Mary in the garden who, uh, um, late morning of the resurrection, uh, she's wandering around and, and Jesus appears to her in, in the garden and they begin to talk and she says, hey, where, where have you put him? And uh, she doesn't recognize him until he speaks her name. I love that story. It's like a sermon all by itself. It's like when Jesus speaks your name, something happens. You know, it's, that's a sermon for another day. She didn't recognize him till he spoke her name. There is this problem, uh, um, for some reason, uh, of these people being unable to recognize Jesus. You know, I'm not going to leave that just yet. When Jesus speaks your name... Have you ever heard that? What a moment. To know that he knows every single one of you. Your name. The very hairs on your head. Awesome. how much God loves you if you're here today and you're not sure he knows your name all right they're by the seashore and they're in the boat and Jesus appears on the seashore and they say to each other in the boat hey there's a guy on the seashore yeah, there's a guy over there. Who is it? I don't know. Can't tell. What's he doing? I don't know. There's a guy on the seashore. They can't tell who it is. So then he speaks. He says, hey, you guys catching any fish? They go, he's talking to us. Who is it? You guys know that guy? Now we didn't catch any fish. Leave us alone. 
throw your net on the other side of the boat. Can you hear this now? Oh my goodness, we've been fishing. He wants to put the net on the other side of the boat. Who is this guy? All of the communication that's going on, and they don't, they don't see who it is until the nets begin to be filled with, with fish. Why maybe did they not recognize him? Why do maybe we not recognize him? Some have suggested that in these appearances, Jesus wore a disguise, like on the road to Emmaus, you know, that he dressed in funny clothes or something. But I find it hard to believe that Jeff Madden, you and I would walk down the road and me wear a funny disguise. And, we, you know, there's, um, other, other people have suggested that there's something about the resurrected Jesus that's different. And, and that is inexplainable. And, and I guess I've got to buy a little bit of that, but it is inexplainable. How, how is a resurrected body uh, that somehow seems to be a person, but not the person you remember, I, I don't know, but it, it evidently was different enough that it threw them. In our case, we don't have that problem because we never dealt with Jesus as a human being, uh, God in human form. We've always dealt with him the way we came to know him through our, our church and by the, the way of the Holy Spirit. We've come to, to know him in our hearts and, and in our minds. So we haven't had to relearn what, does it, mean, what it means to understand uh, the presence of, of Jesus the disciples did. Now, I think that maybe they didn't recognize him because they were busy fishing. It's easy to do. It's easy to get busy. All of you are busy. And um, um, I have said this before, we should make t-shirts and sell them in our bookstore that says, busy is the enemy of the soul. Because it is. It is. All of the things that we get involved in, all of the earthly, human, wonderful things that we get involved in are, are the enemy of, of what God wants to do in our hearts and, and, and in our, our souls. Um, I'm going to meddle a little bit here. When I was a young man uh, in high school, I ran a little bit of track. I played a little bit of football. I was in the band and the orchestra. And if you are a teacher or a leader of any of those things, don't take any of this personally. But back in my day, all of those groups worked together so that you could be in all of those groups. Now, you know what I hear from so many groups, and not just things that my kids are involved in, but things that I can get involved in? They say, this is to be the most important thing in your life. And I understand why they do that. There's so much competition. You know, if they're going to get everybody together, the message has got to be, this is the most important thing in your life. And my kids come home and they tell me, such and such, so-and-so said, this is supposed to be the most important thing in my life. You know, what the, you know what the preacher has to say about that? There is only one thing that has the right to say, I should be the most important thing in your life. And it is not any of our organizations, it is not any of our sports. It is the call of God through Jesus Christ. And the sooner we figure that out, the better our lives and our families are going to go. We get busy with all the things that are going on and we miss him. Uh, we get busy staying up with the Joneses. All those ads that come in the paper for the furniture stores. You know, we're a VIP members at Nebraska Furniture Mart. When my wife drives out there, they come out to meet her. I'm brave now because she went home. <laughs> Think of the last piece of furniture you bought. Did you need that? Did you really need that? We don't even know what a need is, I think. But we work so hard to chase the American dream. We spend ourselves into oblivion chasing the American dream. The preacher has a question today. Is it possible that God has a dream that is bigger than the American dream? That God has a purpose and a plan that's more important than us chasing after all of the stuff that doesn't ever make us happy anyway? We're busy seeking pleasure. We Americans are excellent at seeking pleasure. 
I mean, uh, some of us are planning next year's vacations. Not just this year's, but next year's. We no sooner come back from one trip and we're saying, well, let's do this or let's do that or let's go here or let's go there. We're, we're stuck on having fun. We're stuck on entertaining ourselves. And I'm just as bad as any, anybody. I have no room to talk. But I, I wonder about my life, all the effort and interest I put into things that I find fun is it possible that that gets in the way of what God's purpose for me might be? And the answer is absolutely. Because some of the things that God asks me to do aren't necessarily fun. But I'm so doggone busy entertaining myself, I miss him and I miss his purpose. Mother Teresa said, everybody today seems to be in such a terrible rush, anxious for greater developments and greater riches and so on. So that children have very little time for their parents, parents have very little time for each other, and in the home begins the disruption of the peace of the world. Hear what she's saying? If we can't find peace in our home, we won't have peace in our community or in the world. If we can't treat each other at home in a way where we're setting priorities and teaching people what a, what a whole life is like, we can't expect that to be on display in our community or in the world. Our opportunities to change the world begins in our home, in our families, in the choices that we make and in the things that we call important. Maybe the disciples' minds were on other things. You ever have something good happen and you're happy? Yay! My daughter got into nursing school. Ha! Ha! Woohoo! <laughs> uh, you know, whatever it is. Uh, sometimes my kids come home and they're giddy. You know, they got a good grade. You know, someone agreed to go to the prom with them, whatever. They're just happy as a bee. Sometimes we're so happy, we, we can't hear God's voice. We're just lost in our joy. I don't think that was the disciples' case. I don't think they were happy. Yeah, we've been fishing all night, and we have no fish. And you know, it's not just about the fish. Uh, they're at a crossroads in their world. They were trusting Jesus to deliver them from the Romans. And Jesus has suffered and died. And the resurrection doesn't even solve all of it yet. They're not sure what it's all about. They're, they're not sure what all of this means. And I'm telling you, that night in the boat, they had some long talks about, about what it meant, about, about what it's all about and what they're supposed to do. They are at a crossroads in their life. And I know that every single one of you at one time or another has felt that way. Something, something has brought it to a head. Something has, has taken me down as far as it possibly can. I, I, I've, I've got this thing all wrapped around my axle and I'm at the end of my rope and I, and I don't know what to do. And we get just entrenched in the pain and the, the sorrow and the struggle and the blues. You know what I hate about that? Sometimes the little bitty things. Sometimes I see these things coming and I go, you know, in two weeks that isn't going to matter. But anyway... I mean, it gets a hold of me and I get upset about it and it bothers me. And I think, man, I'm supposed to be bigger than these things. But, but these things grab us and they get a hold of us. And it's so sad because at the very moment that we need God's presence the most, we can't see him or find him because we're totally consumed by being in pain. Maybe they were too far away. How far away does someone have to be before you can't tell who they are? 50 yards? 100 yards? Who is that? Who is that? Oh, that's my daughter. You know, uh, is it possible that the disciples were such a physical distance that they really couldn't tell who Jesus was? Well, maybe. He's so far away, we can't tell who he is, and we hear his voice, and it doesn't sound familiar. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, that, that's a stretch for me. But I do think we human beings can get so far away from God that we no longer recognize his presence. 
There's an old saying, it was a poster on my wall as a, as a teenager. Uh, if you're not as close to God as you used to be, guess who moved? Now, as I grow older, I like that less. And I want to tell you why. That has a, that has a twinge of guilt to it. That, that saying, if you're not as close to God as you used to be, guess who moved, sort of says anytime you don't feel close to God in your life, something's wrong with you. And I don't believe that anymore. I believe there are lots of times when we don't feel close to God just because that's how life is. And that's how love is. I mean, nobody, um, uh, take, take a marriage. You get married and you, you know, you have the honeymoon and everything's wonderful and you're ecstatic and starry-eyed. But relationships have their strong moments and their weak moments. Sometimes you love because you feel love and sometimes you love because it's the right thing to do. And I think every Christian that's honest with himself has to understand that there are some times that, that we just have valleys. And it's not because you're bad and it's not because you went far away. It's just part of any relationship that we're going to get involved in. Sometimes we're just not going to feel as close to God as we could. But now having said that, let me say there are things that will keep us from God. And there are some things that we human beings get involved in that will pull us away and keep us separated from them. We can become so selfish that we just push him away every time we hear his voice. We can become addicted to things where, and, and some of them are, I mean, people can get addicted to shopping. Crazy things we can get stuck on, and we're just stuck. And, and I don't want to excuse the idea that our behavior doesn't play a role in how close we feel to God. It's something we need to consider it's something that every person needs to look at in their life. And if there's something you can do to make it better, of course, we want to be sure and do that. Maybe they didn't recognize him, and this is my favorite point, is because they didn't expect to see him there. You ever gone somewhere and, uh, you know, maybe I run into Todd clear in, in Nebraska. I did, what? Todd, what? I was in Columbia a few years ago for annual conference, and I picked up somebody. We were on the way to church, and at the hotel where I, picked, where I went to pick him up, I went in to call the desk for them to come down, and there was a couple of families from our church that were out on a trip. I said, what? what? What are you doing here? This is not our town. This is not our church. You can't be here. Uh, last week, my wife, who normally is out of town during the week, uh, was off. And she came up to church to see if I wanted to go to lunch with her. The $1.50 hot dog and Coke at Costco, but that's okay. I didn't know she was here. In my brain, she's always gone. I came around the corner and saw my wife in the foyer talking to somebody. And said, ah, you're here! I was so glad I had a happy response, you know. It could have been... I, I didn't expect to see her. Sometimes I think we walk right past things because we're not looking for what is there. So I want to ask you, is there some place you go where God isn't? Is there some place you can run to where he is not? Is there some pit that you can fall into where when you cry out, he will not hear your voice? We have to learn to see him every place. And I don't just mean in the beautiful sunrise and the beautiful sunset. I don't just mean in the glory of the tulips that are coming up and the, the trees that are beginning to leaf out. We need to understand that when we are at the crossroads of life, when we are facing a difficult time, God's presence is there with us if we will but recognize him and call on the name of Jesus. What was true for them is true for us now. It may be a difficult time in your life. Things may be changing. You may have some, some feelings of pain. But Jesus is present and everything is okay. He calls us to be about something different than human busyness. He calls us to be about something more than just being in the boat and, and, and doing the human fishing things. But wherever we are, he is with us. Look for him. 
see, see him with you. Let us pray. And Lord, I know that there are people here today who desperately need an awareness of your presence in their life. And so I just ask you not to give them a car, not to give them a better job. I ask you to make yourself known to them. Disclose yourself. Surprise them. As each of us looks to see you in the good and in the bad moments, in the happy and the sad ones, God, by your Holy Spirit, make yourself real. Touch each heart. Fill each life with that truth that, that everything is okay because you are here. It is well with our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.